Welcome back everybody to Deep Learning. So today we want to talk about again feed forward networks and in this fourth part the main focus will be on layer abstraction. Of course we talked about those neurons and individual nodes but this grows really complex for larger networks. So we want to introduce this layering concept also in our computation of the gradients and this is really useful because we can then talk directly about gradients on entire layers and don't need to go towards all of the different nodes. Of course, we are building on all these um, great abstractions that people have invented over the millennia, such as matrix multiplications. So how do we express this? Let's recall what our single neuron is doing. The single neuron is computing essentially an inner product of its weights. By the way, we are skipping over the bias in this notation. We are expanding our vector by an additional one element. This allows us to describe the bias and also the inner product simply as shown on the slide here. This is really nice because then you can see that the output y hat is just an inner product. Now think about the case that we have m neurons which means that we get some y hat index m. All of them are inner products. So if you bring this into a vector notation, you can see that the vector y hat is nothing else than a matrix multiplication of x with this matrix w. You see that a fully connected layer is nothing else than a matrix multiplication. So we can essentially represent arbitrary connections and topologies using this fully connected layer. Then we can also apply a pointwise nonlinearity such that we get the nonlinear effect. The nice thing about matrix notation is of course that we can describe now the entire layer derivatives using matrix calculus. So for our fully connected layer we would then get the following configuration. Three elements for the input and then weights for every neuron. Let's say you have two neurons. Then we get these weight vectors. We multiply the two with x. In the forward pass, we determine this y hat for the entire module using a matrix. If you want to compute the gradients, then we need exactly two partial derivatives. And these are exactly the same ones as we already mentioned. We need the derivative with respect to the weights and we need the derivative with respect to the inputs. The derivative with respect to the weights is going to be the partial derivative with respect to w and the partial derivative with respect to x is going to be the derivative with respect to the inputs. So how do we compute this? Well, we have the layer that is y hat equals to wx. So there's a matrix multiplication in the forward pass. Then we need the derivative with respect to the weights. Now we can see that what we essentially need to do is to compute a matrix derivative here. The derivative of y hat with respect to w is going to be simply x transpose. So if we have the loss that comes into our module, the update to our weights is going to be this loss vector multiplied with x transpose. So we have some loss vector and x transpose, which essentially means that you have an outer product. One is a column vector and the other one is a row vector because of the transpose. So if you multiply the two, you will end up with a matrix. The above partial derivative with respect to w will always result in a matrix. If you look at the bottom row, you need the partial derivative of y hat with respect to x. Also something you can find in the matrix cookbook, by the way. It is a very useful tool and I'll provide the reference in the description of this video. You will find all kinds of matrix derivatives in this one. So, if you do that, you can see that for the above equation, the partial with respect to x is going to be w transpose. Now you have w transpose 
multiply it again with some loss vector. This loss vector times a matrix is going to be a vector again. This is the vector that you will need to pass on in the backpropagation process towards the next higher layer. Okay, let's look into some example. We have some simple example first and then a multi-layer example next. So the simple example is going to be the same network as we had it already. So this is a network without any nonlinearity w x. Now we need some loss function and here we don't take cross entropy but we take the L2 loss which is also a very common vector norm. What it does, it simply takes the output of the network, subtract the desired output and computes the L2 norm. This means that we element-wise square the different input vector values and sum them all up. In the end, we would have to take a square root, but we want to omit this, so we take our L2 norm to the power of 2. When we now compute the derivatives of this L2 norm to the power of 2, of course we have a factor of 2 showing up. This will be cancelled out by the factor of 1 over 2 in the beginning. By the way, this is a regression loss and it also has statistical relations. We will talk about this when we talk about loss functions in more detail. The nice thing with L2 loss is that you can also find its matrix derivatives in the matrix cookbook. We now compute the partial derivative of L with respect to y hat. This will give you then wx minus y. And we can continue to compute the update for our weights. So the update for our weights is what we want to compute using the loss function's derivative. The derivative of the loss function with respect to the input was wx minus y times x transpose. This will give us an update for the matrix weight. The other derivative that we want to compute is the partial derivative of the loss with respect to x. So this is going to be, as we've already seen on the previous slide, w transpose times the vector that comes from the loss function, wx minus y, as we have determined in the third row of this slide. Okay, let's add some layers to our estimator and we add now three nested functions. Here we have some linear matrices, so this is an academic example. You could see that by multiplying W1, W2 and W3 with each other, they would simply collapse into a single matrix. Still, I find this example useful because it shows you what can actually happen in the computation of the backpropagation process and why those steps are really useful. So again, we take the L2 loss functions. Here we have our three matrices inside. Next, we have to go ahead and compute the derivatives. Now for the derivatives, we start with layer three, the most outer layer. So you see that we now compute the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to W3. First, the chain rule. Then we have to compute the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to f3 of x. The partial derivative of this loss function, again, is simply the inner part of the L2 norm. So this is w3, w2, w1x minus y. The partial derivative of the net is going to be w2, w1x transposed as we've seen also on the previous slide. Note that I'm indicating the infinity of the matrix operator using a dot. For matrices, it makes a difference whether you multiply them from the left or from the right. Both directions are different, hence I'm indicating that you have to compute this product from the right-hand side. Now let's do that and we end up with the final update for W3, which is simply computed from those two expressions. Now the partial derivative with respect to W2 is a bit more complicated because we have to apply the chain rule twice. So again, we have to compute the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to F3 of X.
then we need the partial derivative of f3 of x with respect to w2, which means we have to apply the chain rule again. So we have to expand the partial derivative of f3 of x to f2 of x, and then the partial derivative of f2 of x with respect to w2. This doesn't change much. The loss term is the same as we used before. Now if we compute the partial derivative of f3 of x with respect to f2 of x, remember f2 of x equals to w2 w1x, it's going to be w3 transpose. And we have to multiply it from the left hand side. Then we go ahead and compute the partial derivative of f2 of x with respect to w2. You remain with w1x transpose. So the final matrix derivative is going to be the product of the three terms. We can repeat this for the last layer, but now we have to apply the chain rule again. We see already that two parts can be pre-computed, but we have to apply the derivative again. So here we then get the partial derivative of f2 of x with respect to f1 of x and the partial derivative of f1 of x with respect to w1, which then yields two terms that we have not used before. The partial derivative of x2 of x with respect to f1 of x is going to be w2 transpose. Then we still have to compute the partial derivative of f1 of x with respect to w1. And this is going to be x transpose. So we end up with the product of the four terms for this partial derivative. Now we can see if you do the back propagation, we end up in a very similar way of processing. So first we compute the path through the entire network and evaluate the loss function. Then we can look at the different partial derivatives and depending on where I want to go, I have to compute the respective partials. For the update of the last layer, I have to compute the partial derivative of the loss function and multiply it with the partial derivative of the last layer with respect to the weights. Now if I go to the second last layer, I have to compute the partial derivative with respect to the loss function, the partial derivative of the last layer with respect to the inputs, and the partial derivative of the second last layer with respect to the weights to get the update. If I want to go to the first layer, I have to compute all the respective backpropagation steps for the entire layers until I end up with the respective update on the very first layer. Now you can see that we can pre-compute a lot of those values and then reuse them, which allows us to implement backpropagation very efficiently. Let's summarize what we've seen so far. We've seen that we can combine the softmax activation function with cross entropy loss. Then we can very naturally work with multi-class problems. We use gradient descent as the default choice for training our network and we can achieve local minima using the strategy. We can of course compute gradients only numerically by finite differences and this is very useful for checking your implementations. This is something you will find definitely needful in the exercises. Then we use the backpropagation algorithm to compute the gradients very efficiently. In order to be able to update the weights of the fully connected layers, we've seen that they can be abstracted as a complete layer. Hence, we can also compute layer-wise derivatives. So it's not required to compute everything on a node level, but you can really go into layer abstractions. You saw that matrix calculus turns out to be very useful here. Fascinating. Well, what happens next in deep learning? Well, we will see that right now we have only a limited number of loss functions. So we will see the problem adapted loss functions for regression and classification. The very simple optimization that we talked about right now with a single EDA is probably not the right way to go. So there are better optimization programs. They can be adapted to the needs of every single parameter. Then we'll also see an argument why neural networks shouldn't perform that well and some recent insights why they actually perform 
quite well. I also have a couple of comprehensive questions. You should definitely be able to name different loss functions for multi-class classification. One hot encoding is something everybody needs to know if you want to take the written exam. You will probably have to be able to describe it. Then of course something that seems very suitable for a written exam is the computation of finite differences. So this is not just useful for your daily routine that you check your gradients, but it might also be very relevant for the written exam. You have to be able to describe the backpropagation algorithm. And to be honest, I think this, although it's a bit academic, way of multi-layer abstraction using the backpropagation in this matrix notation is very useful. So I think it's very nice if you want to explain the backpropagation in, for example, an exam situation. What else do we have to be able to describe? The problem with exploding and vanishing gradients. What happens if you choose your either too high or too low? What's a loss curve? How does it change over the iterations? Please take a look at those graphs. They're really relevant and they also help you understand what's going on with your training process. So you need to be aware of those and also it should be clear to you by now why the sine function is a bad choice for an activation function. Of course, we have plenty of references and you can see that I have to click several times here and I will post them again below the description of this video. So I hope you also enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching and looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye.